So we're a little late starting, so I may talk a little bit fast to get us back on time. So the title of my talk today is Can We Use Living Mulch to Be Deployed in Conservation Tillage System to Support the Fight Against Weeds? But I'm not going to just talk about living mulch. I'll talk about other um, cover crop types. So this is the outline of my presentation. So I'll basically talk about weeds. I'll talk about integrated weed management. I'll talk about cover crops, conservation tillage. Then I'll show two uh, research that we conducted. So I thought I'd start off with a definition of weeds. So weeds are plants that possess adapted features which allows them to evade, survive, and reproduce in crop and system. Now the most important part of that definition is the adapted features. Because some the old school definitions of weeds, people probably know that you say a weed is a plant out of place. They would say a corn plant in a soybean field was a weed, and that's not true. A corn in a soybean plant soybean plant is a mistake. It's not a weed because it doesn't have adapted features. That corn plant the next season, you're not going to find that corn plant everywhere in ditch banks and other places. And that's what make weeds weeds. The adapted features allows them to evade all kinds of different places. So the central goal of weed management is basically to reduce weed competition and reproduction to a level that is acceptable. We have different threshold with respect to how much weeds we allow in our farms and to stop the production of weed seeds and proper use that may cause problems in future plants. And this is what differentiates weed management from weed control. Weed control, you have a weed to show up in your field and you try to manage that particular weed that season. With weed management, you're thinking about future weed problems and how can I prevent those from occurring? And the best way to do that is use integrated weed management, which combines all these techniques, cultural, chemical, mechanical, biological, genetic practice for weed management. And again, it's because weeds have the adapted features. So what we need to do is throw as many tools at those weeds as possible to prevent them from getting comfortable in a, um, in a field environment. So again, integrated weed management involves predicting and preventing weed establishment. So that's the critical period about integrated weed management or the critical um, thought. So with that, we're going to talk about some preventive methods, both preventive as well as um, control practices. So again, with integrated weed management, the thing is, I'm sorry, let's go back. Some of this stuff is like common knowledge things. For instance, we take site selection. And that's important if you're growing a vegetable crop. Vegetable crops tend to not compete very well with weed. So the general rule of thumb is, unless you have two consecutive seasons where you had good weed control in a particular field, generally they say don't plant vegetables in that particular field because they're not going to compete very well. Or you may have a perennial weed problem. Vegetable crops, they don't compete well with perennial weeds. So they typically say if you have a perennial weed problem in a field, don't plant vegetables in there until you clean out that problem. And in some situation, you don't have a choice. Say you only grow vegetable crops, and then you have that field that's had been weedy for years, and you can't do it. You have to plant that crop. Well, typically what you want to do is you want to take the most competitive vegetable crop, and you plant it in the most weed-infested field, and then you take the least competitive crop, and you put it in that field that you have good weed control over a period of time. And also crop selection. Different crops compete differently. Also, different cultivars within the same crop compete differently. So you want to try to find the cultivar that works best in your field situation that's going to outcompete weeds. Crop and pattern. We think more of things like that in soybeans, you know, narrow row spacing versus wide row spacing, narrow row spacing, that canopy closes up sooner so it can suppress weeds population. And you sometimes have those situations with vegetables. In some situations, you can plant that vegetable row a little bit tighter, or you can Think about lima beans where you can throw a little bit more beans closer in that, in that row. And what does that do? Well, that canopy closes up sooner. And also, the more seeds you have on the ground, that's less niche spaces for weeds to germinate. And of course, you have to think about yield, though. If squeezing that plant a little bit closer makes those plants compete with each other and you don't have good yield, then you can't use that strategy. Planting date. Sometimes you can do this to avoid troublesome weeds. Sometimes if you know the history of that field, and you know when you have those troublesome weeds to pop up, maybe you can try to plant before that to get that canopy closed and then it overshadow those, those troublesome weeds. Or maybe you can take out those troublesome weeds before planting your crop. So knowing the history of the field, understand those weeds when they pop up, sometimes you can plant to sort of to go around that. 
and of course crop health and vigor. And basically what we meant here is that if you have a vigorous growing crop, you want it to grow as vigorous as possible so it can compete with weeds. But if that crop has additional stress on it, for instance, we may have crops that have insects on it. They may not be at threshold level, but that's additional stress on a crop. And that additional stress on a crop, even if it's not at economic threshold damaging level, then that crop isn't going to compete as well with weeds. So you want to make sure that all other health-related issues of that crop is good. And then nutrient placement. The basic idea here is we want to fertilize the plant. We don't want to fertilize the weeds. So we think about broadcast application of fertilizer when you broadcast it versus banning. it. When you ban it, you're giving it directly to that crop, the crop that needs it. When you broadcast it, then you're also feeding the weeds in places where the crop isn't going to take up that fertilizer, but the weeds are. And then also you have some weed seeds that are dormant and they're going to remain dormant. But when you fertilize them, they, that nitrogen kicks in. Sometimes it kicks them out of that dormancy. So sometimes you can be helping to create a weed problem when you fertilize um, the weed seeds. And then plant technique. And this basically means direct seeding versus transplant. The downsides of transplant, it can be a more expensive process when you have to grow out those transplant. But the idea here, if you direct seed versus transplant, you increase that critical weed free period. The critical weed free period is the amount of time you have to manage those weeds or to manage the weeds in that particular system to make sure there's not a, a year reduction. <laughs> And with direct seeding, that critical weed free period, it starts early when you have to worry about those weeds and it extends a longer period of time because with transplant, the canopy is going to close much more faster and also they're not going to immediately be competing with weeds. The transplant is going to be up before the weed seed starts to germinate. And then the other thing is crop rotation. Now crop rotation is the cornerstone of any pest management practice. It doesn't matter whether it's weeds, insects, or disease. But for weeds, it's a more elaborate process of this crop rotation. The whole idea is to keep the weeds off balance. Remember what I said? Weeds have adaptive features. So you have to keep changing up that system to keep them off balance. Because if you don't change up that system, then basically what happened is weeds are going to adapt to your management practice. And then you're going to have one, two, or three species of weed that do very well in that system because they found a niche. You keep doing that same practice, they found a niche that they can um, overcome. So again, crop rotation is an elaborate process um, in weed control. Well, things like alternating crops with different types of vegetation. So we have leafy crops such as lettuce, cabbage. We have bulb crops such as onions and garlics. Then we have root crops such as potatoes. You have fruit crops such as tomatoes and zucchini. You want to put all those in the rotation system. Again, keep those weeds guessing what's coming next. You alternate grass with dicots, things like maize with vegetables. Avoid succeeding crops of the same family, because sometimes you manage those similarly, so you, again, you're creating a niche that weeds can get used to. Alternate poor and high weed competitors. That means, again, we go back to that first thing I was saying, say you have this field, and, it's, and you say, you know what, I can grow onions in this field, because there's not much weeds in this field. But what happens if you keep growing that poorly competitive crop over and over? eventually those weeds are going to take over. So you want to mix in a high competitive with poor competitive. And then you also want to avoid problematic weeds in specific crops. And this is the reason why this is a critical is that there are some weeds that are so closely associated with that crop. Everything that you're doing to make that crop grow more vigorous, that weed needs it also because they're so closely linked. So if you have a situation, maybe a solanaceous weed in a tomato crop, you want to avoid growing tomatoes in that field until you can get that weed under control. And avoid crops with light weed management tactics. So even if you have this really nice rotation scheme going on, but you're using the same practice over and over, you can still have a weed that takes advantage of that. And it's typically, the thing is, once a weed get a hole in your field, it's much difficult to manage it than to prevent it from occurring. And sometimes people tell you, what's the best ideal situation in a field? To have a diversity of weeds. And you know why that is? Because that means it's not one particular weed species that can take advantage of what you're doing. So that's why you have a diversity, because they're all trying to find their way into your field. 
Now, if you have one weed that constantly show up over and over and it just dominate your field, it means that particular weed have overcome your management practice and found a niche. So it means you got to change things up. So here, I, I just sort of came up with a crop rotation scheme based on all these different um, hints or facts. And I wouldn't say go out and, and, uh, and try this. I'm not going to say it's going to work because any crop rotation scheme you come up with, you got to go and revisit to make sure that there's not one weed that's taking a, that is escaping or taking advantage of it. So here we start off with peas. And peas is a leafy crop. It's also a cool season crop. Then I follow that with squash. I should say peas is a pretty good competitor to do. And I follow that with squash. Squash is totally different from peas. It's a fruit crop. Not that good of a com competitor. It's a warm season crop. So then I follow that with potatoes. <coughs> It's now I switched it to a tuber crop. Potato is going to be managed differently, and it's a pretty good competitor. Then I switched to cabbage. Cabbage is a cool season crop. It's a leafy crop. It's also a good competitor. So now I really confused those weeds. I come in with sweet corn, first monocot in the system. Those weeds don't know what happened to them. They're right now is they're taking a suitcase and they're moving away from that field. And then the thing that I don't have up here something like corn, field corn and soybeans, you throw that into that rotation too if you're doing that. Again, you want to keep the weeds off balance and that's what, you, what we're trying to do with rotation. And again, always revisit your rotation to make sure there's not one particular weed that you see, oh my goodness, this weed is beating this rotation. It means you need to change it up a little bit. And then there's other tools, mulching, whether you're using paper mulch or cover crop mulch. Typically with something like the paper mulch or compost, they typically say you want it at least an inch and a half um, in thickness. Sanitation, oh, some of the worst weed problems actually start from poor sanitation. Machinery, you go in one field that's weed infested, you don't clean that machinery, and then you go into another field, you just may have transferred those weeds to that particular field because they latch on, the seeds will latch on to equipment. Um, uncropped areas is also important. Sometimes people look in their field and they say, oh, I have a clean field. They don't care about the weeds that's on the ditch banks or surrounding that barn, but eventually those weeds will make it into your field. So you want to also make sure uncropped area are remain clean because those weeds will make it into your field. And then sometimes they say do nothing. Do nothing may be a situation where you have a late in the season, you see some weeds break out in your field. It's more costly to remove those weeds than to just leave them there. A, However, that may change if you have a really nasty weed, something like Palmer amaranth, for instance, that can produce thousands of seeds. Even if there's just one plant out in that field, you may say, you know what, it's not going to be any economical damage. But remember what I just talked about integrated weed management? It's thinking about future problems. So that will cause future problems, so you may want to take that out. And that's biological control. Not a lot of research on that, but we have weed seed predators that will actually eat weed seeds. And of course, there's hand pulling, chemical, and the thing, chemical is a part of integrated pest management, but the thing to remember is you don't have to always broadcast. Sometimes you can spot spray or bandit spray, reduce that amount of herbicide. <laughs> and then of course tillage and cultivation is very popular among organic producers, flame weeder, using superior cultivars. I talked about genetic diversity, having a superior cultivar that can compete well with weeds, then more. Now, mowing, in many instances, you're not going to go into a crop field and mow. You, maybe if you have a potato crop and there's weeds pops up, you can mow it and it's not damaged your potato crop. But mowing is more so those non-cropped areas where I say you may have weeds going up, such as outside the field in the, in the border area, you have weeds and you can just mow them because all you want to do is prevent them from flowering and going to seed. And then companion plant. Companion plant is a little bit tricky. The idea here is growing two different crops or more crops in the same field. Yeah, it's a tricky when you're trying to manage two crops. But the idea is if there's more plants on the ground, there's less niche places for weeds to germinate. And then there's cover cropping, which we're going to talk about today. And I like cover cropping. And there's many ways that cover crops can, can um, reduce weeds. They compete with weeds. In other words, cover crops are the weeds of weeds because they compete with them. And they, they can form physical barriers, like you're using a hay mulch, physical barrier, prevent weeds from germinating because they can't get light to them. Augment weed seed predators, these things listed as crickets and, and um, carabbits that feed on weed seeds, they tend to do better in, in cover crop situations, especially um, um, cover crop residue. Um, 
They can create a weed suppressive soil community, believe it or not. Sometimes the green manure, they change the community within the soil where they change the bacteria, these bacteria that can actually prevent weed seeds from germinating. There are some bacteria that can infest weed seeds. Uh, releasing nitrogen compounds, this can be good or bad. The idea here, you have a legume. The legume releases nitrogen compounds. It makes that plant grow more vigorous so it can outcompete weeds. But in some instances, the weeds may take advantage of that. Then you can have a negative effect. Releasing allele chemicals. We know things like rye, they release so chemi allele chemical compounds that prevent weed seeds from germinating. Sometimes the cover crop just enhance the crop growth, make it more vigorous so it can outcompete weeds, and then sometimes it lowers in soil temperature. Low, lowering soil temperature is one of those things that can be negative or positive. It'd be positive if it lowered the soil temperature so that weed seed doesn't germinate, but it's negative. If you have a warm season crop, that warm season crop grows a bit more slower, but you have a weed that is more tolerant to that cool weather, then it's going to outcompete the crop. So the other question is, why are cover crops so great for IPM? I talked about a, different, a bunch of different management practices that you can use, but that's the reason why I like cover crops, because you can get so many additional benefits from cover crops. Soil health, reducing greenhouse gassing, conserving moisture, organic matter, enhancing nutrients. These are a lot of benefits. So even if that cover crop isn't the best for weed suppression, you may be still getting a bunch of other benefits from it. Also, cover crops can target multiple pest complexes. And this is one of my, one thing I really like about cover crops. You think about it, you're probably never gonna read a chemical label. And that chemical label say, you spray this in the crop and it's gonna control nematodes, it's gonna control insects, it's gonna control weeds. It'll never happen. But sometimes if you get the right cover crop in the right system, you can have that single cover crop species, or maybe you can use a mixture of cover crop that can do well in suppressing insects, weeds, and nematodes all concurrently. And there's many ways to deploy and manipulate cover crops. Whether you can use chemical suppression, mechanical suppression, cultivation, natural. Natural means some of them, they just die on their own. I think um, Aaron was talking about crimson clover. That's one of those cover crops that's just died to nest late spring, right? On its own. And the other thing is they're always creating these strange equipments to let you do more with cover crops. Look at this thing up here. <laughs> a raised bed roller crimper. That's what that is. And in here, they have this, this is in Italy, an uh, inline roller crimper. Basically what happens is it crimps it, and then it makes a little slit while it's crimping it so you can drop the seeds in there or transplant. So they're always making new equipment for, to, um, for cover crop. And then there's so many strategies, whether you want to use the green manure, green manure because you want the nutrient benefits. It might be a legume. Surface residue, you just leave it on the residue because mainly you just want it to suppress the form of barrier to weed emergen or erosion control. Then dying mulch. Dying mulch is one of my favorite ones. And a dying mulch is basically a cover crop. It's interplanted or growing along with that cash crop, but it doesn't live the entire duration of that cash crop. It senesces. And the reason why I like dying mulch is because we sometimes use cover crops to try to enhance beneficial insects. And it works really well, but it's a sink. In other words, those beneficials stay in that cover crop and they don't go over to the cash crop. Sometimes they even attract beneficial from the cash crop. But with the dying mulch, it attracts them, it dies. Once it dies, it forces those natural enemies over to that cash crop. And then we have the living mulch, which I'm going to talk about today. I love living mulches. And living mulches, lift the, it's basically interplanted with that cash crop and it lives the entire duration of that cash crop. The biggest problem with living mulch is they compete with that cash crop. So it's always tricky trying to figure out how you grow it and not let it compete with that cash crop. But I like them because you can get more benefits from living mulches. And then sometimes you can use a mixture. You can use a mixture, a same cover crop, you can use that same cover crop as a living mulch, a dying mulch, or a surface mulch, or green manure within the same field, depending on how you treat it. The other thing I like, whether you use a living mulch or green manure or dying mulch or organic mulch, all of these are compatible with conservation tillage. And you may not think things like a living mulch or green manure, but they are. Because again, you don't necessarily have to till in the entire cover crop within a field. So you can still mix, put in a green manure within your system and it's still compatible with conservation tillage because you're not tilling in all of it. And this is great. 
because we know NRCS is promoting conservation tillage. A lot of agencies are now, and it's basically tillage that limits soil disruption. And the good thing about this is there's savings in that. There's less use of equipment entering the field, less fuel costs, so there's a saving associated with conservation tillage. Now, there's been a spike in conservation tillage research in vegetables. Now, no-till conservation tillage is pretty much adopted in, in things like cotton, corn, and soybeans. They have the system down, but vegetables is not doing very well. It's very much lagging behind. But they're doing it. The adoption rate is very low in vegetables. Uh, one other problem is, is weed suppression. Trying to use no-till and weed suppression, especially in organic farming, is very difficult with no-till. And you could have problems with perennial weeds. But now what they're, they're trying to combine that, that no-tillage with cover crop residue, and they're seeing some benefits. One of the negative aspects, one of the biggest negative aspects of no-till and vegetable system is warm season vegetables. That vegetation on that surface keeps that soil a little bit cool, and those warm season vegetables don't like it. So you have that yield drag or that delayed harvest because it grows a little bit slower. Things like tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, they don't like it. Hey, talk about those small seeded vegetables like carrots, they really don't like no-till situation. They just don't do very well. So now what people are doing, and then so there's other problems associated with no-till. So you can tell farmers, hey, I want you to practice no-till. But there's a lot of benefits of no-till, right? Warming up that soil in the spring, I mean, that's the thing that you lose because some people, they want to warm up that soil in the spring so they can get that, plant that warm season vegetable crop real early and get it out in the market before the market gets flooded. Some people need to till it in because they're using a legume cover crop. They want the nitrogen benefit. Some people are working on raised beds. They compact the soil. They want to loosen up the soil. Perennial weed problems. Perennial weeds can be a problem, can become a problem in a no-till situation. So that's some other problems associated with no-till. Now there's been increased interest in script tillage. I consider script tillage a hybrid between no-till and conventional till. Because the idea behind script till is you're only tillage in the area where you're gonna put that crop row. And then the rest, can be no-till. So this technique, it overcomes some of these constraints associated with no-till. Again, the tillage is limited that's to the intro area where you're gonna plant the crop. Um, and then they also find reduced fuel and labor costs, healthier soils, maintain crop yields, and they've seen this with things like beans, cucumbers, winter squash, summer squash, uh, sweet corn, broccoli. And look, even that small seeded vegetable, carrot, didn't have a problem with the script till. Again, because you're at least tilling where you're gonna plant that vegetable crop. So now we can start telling farmers, hey, those same ones who are seeing problems, these other problems with no-till, practice script till. Well, with script till, you can warm up that soil because you're tilling just where you're gonna plant that crop. So then that soil has a chance to warm up. Nitrogen. Again, you're tilling it under where you're gonna plant the crop so you can get those nitrogen benefits if you're growing a legume. Compacted soil, again, you're tilling where you're gonna plant that vegetable crop within that row so you can loosen up that soil. Perennial weeds, well, it's not the best for perennial weeds, but strip tilling can also help with that perennial weed problem if you team it up with another type of cover crop tactic, and we're gonna talk about that later. Raised beds. No, strip tilling is not compatible with raised bed. But my understanding is there's another technique, I've never tried this technique, called ridge till. The idea here is you can leave some residue on the side and still have a raised bed. So there I just sort of gave you some information on weeds, integrated weed management, conservation, tillage, as well as cover crop. So now we're gonna talk about some research in which we conducted. So this particular project here, this was a four-year project. Um, and this was on land that was going through organic transition. And it was a rotation of eggplant, sweet corn, then eggplant, and then sweet corn. So this particular was a multidisciplinary project. We were looking at everything from insects to greenhouse gas emission, a lot of things. But the data focuses on weeds, so we're going to just focus on those particular objectives. 
So this particular study, it consists, it had two conventional till practices. One was bare ground where it was, the field was cultivated and bare ground, and then another one was black plastic where it was cultivated and then we used black plastic. And then we had two conservation tillage practices. One was no-till and the other was strip-till. Now all these particular treatments started out with this cover crop mixture of crimson clover, forest, radish, and rye. But it was once, we, just before we planted the vegetable crop, we did different that way made these, that distinguished how these treatments were um, different. So again, just to kind of show you the process, again, it was a mixture of the forest radish, the rye, and the um, crimson clover. Of course, forest radish is going to be one of those cover crops that do pretty well in the fall. So it starts out in the fall, it looks very good. There's basically no evidence that, little evidence that rye, crimson clover was planted. And of course, you have the, that low winter temperature, maybe 20 degrees for a couple of nights, and it this is the, basically kills off the forest radish. And by springtime, there's no evidence that forest radish, but you have a nice stand of rye and crimson clover. And then basically what we did, we went in and we flail mow it. And then once we flare more, this is when these treatment became different. So with respect to the black plastic, basically we discultivated. So at this particular stage, there's no evidence that there were cover crop there. We laid the black plastic and we planted eggplant. Eggplant was the first crop. In the no-till, basically just flare more, planted the eggplant or sweet corn directly into it. Bare ground, again, that one was cultivated, disc till, no evidence cover crop was there. And then in the strip till, basically, we did a narrow till strip, about 10 inch wide, only where we were going to plant the eggplant. And in the rest, we remained like no till. So you can see the residue on the outside of the row. So then we took data on weed. We, we monitor weed differently. We wanted to see how much control we got of weed within the row and in between the rows. So we took data on within row and between row differently. We timed how long it took to hand remove for someone who was hand weeding. And then of course, there was two areas in each plot where we allowed the main weedy for a long period of time. The idea here was what if someone didn't get around to weed in their field? How much weed would they have in these four different treatments? And then of course, we picked the fruit and, and took yield. So I'm gonna start first, just show a little results, and this is the weed biomass data. So again, we have our four treatments, the bare ground, the black plastic, the no-till, strip-till, and this is weed biomass, and this was in those weedy areas. These were the areas that we didn't do any weed from 29th May when the eggplant was planted to 6th August. So you can see here, the black plastic and the no-till has the least amount of weed biomass. So we didn't have weeds popping up in the black plastic, it was between the rows. And then in bare ground and strip-till. Now look at strip-till. A lot of weeds, you know where those weeds were? In the row. A lot of weeds were in the row. So, so it did pretty good where that residue was down, but in the row, a lot of weeds came up. Then we also took measure, how long did it take us to clean up these plots in different weeding events? So this is first one, shows the eggplant. Again, we have our four treatments, the bare ground, black plastic, no-till, strip-till. Now on 7th June, you see those two dashes there? What happened was in the black plastic and the bare ground plots, a lot of weeds started popping up. The crew panicked and they had the farm manager to go in and do a rescue tillage treatment. So it's not really a fair comparison because of that. I think they did two, two rescue treatments. So the, the good comparison here is between the no-till and strip-till. And look at that strip-till. A lot of weeds, again, in that intro area. But what I found interesting is that Although the bare ground black plastic got that rescue treatment, you can see that the, the amount of hours that were hand weed and clean it up was still very similar between no-till and, and those two treatments. Actually, no-till did slightly better than the bare ground. So, in, so this shows the second year when we rotated in the sweet corn. Again, our four treatments, bare ground, black plastic, no-till, strip-till. They didn't panic this time, and you can see here the least amount of time weeding was in that no-till plot, followed by the no, um, I'm sorry, in the no-till, and then followed by black plastic. Strip-till, still, we're a little bit disappointed in that strip-till. Now, in year three, we rotated back to the eggplant. Again, the bare ground, black plastic, no-till, strip-till. The best was the black plastic, but look what happened. Look at that no-till. It fell apart during year three. This was the best treatment up until year three, but then it fell apart. Excuse me, I missed the part about the no-till. Was 
that organic too, or did you spray it? No, all of this is on organic transition, so none of it has spray. It wasn't sprayed, they went in and tilled it. The no-till. No, no, not the no-till, the bare ground black plastic, the first year. The first year they went in, they tilled it because they felt the weeds were getting out of place and they didn't think they could handle it. So, so no-till, no, no tillage and no-till. But what happened was the third year, you can look at no-till, and it did similar as bare ground, basically fell apart. So the question is, what happened? Well, there's probably a couple of things happening. Remember I talked about rotation, how important crop rotation is? Well, basically we follow a weak competitive crop with another weakly competitive crop. So that created, that contributed to the problem. But the biggest problem was the acting farm manager at the time changed the seeding rate of that rye. So the reason why he did that, because when you use a flare mower and you have a lot of cover crop biomass, you have to drive that flare mower, that tractor really slow. So that farm manager, the acting farm manager say, was a little impatient. So he said, well, I'll take care of the problem. What I'll do is I'll reduce the seeding rate of that ride, then I can drive a little bit faster. The problem with that is it doesn't help. It doesn't work. The reason is because when you reduce the seeding rate of a grass cover crop, Sometimes what happens is the individual plants would tiller more and they make up for that biomass. But what he did was by reducing that seeding rate, there was less rice seed on the ground, which meant now there's more niche places for weeds to germinate. So that's what helped create that problem. Now, marketable yield. Kind of what I predicted. Bare ground, black plastic, no-till. Look at that no-till. Significant lower yield. You remember I said one of the problems with no-till? Soil is cold, right? So those vegetable, warm season vegetables such as eggplant didn't like that cold surface. So although it did really good in suppressing those weeds, it kept that soil surface cool so the eggplant grew a little bit slower. So we got that yield drag. Did you take any soil samples to see uh, yeah. how, how fast the crimson was releasing in each? The soil scientist, actually Gui is a soil scientist, so she did all of that. She did all of that. Actually, she, there was probably more soil data than there is other data, which is why we wanted her to make sure that we weren't weak, weakness on that aspect yeah. of it. So is it because the crimson wasn't releasing nitrogen as much too? Was that another reason for that low yield? Uh, it was, I would say it's mainly the, the uh, cold soil because all of them had that crimson clover mixture, yeah. So basically what we found from this four-year study was that the weeds were greatest in bare ground when there was no cultivation, um, all, but we did have high weed density in this strip till within the strip till um, row. We had lower weed density and no-till overall and black plastic below the mulch. In other words, we didn't have weeds popping up in that black plastic mulch. It was between the rows where the black plastic wasn't reaching. And then we found that plant growth was slower and yield was lower in no-till plots. Interesting, we did find the quality of eggplant was better in strip till plots. Also, the sweet corn, like that strip till plots, we had better yield of sweet corn in there. So the other thing we, I talked about earlier, where I said typically when you think about conservation tillage, there's a save, there's um, save. So what we did do, we monitored how many times equipment had to go into those different treatments versus um, the, the conventional till and the um, conservation till and, no-till and um, script till So let's just focus on this last one, activity after final harvest. What do we have to do after we harvest the crop to prepare it to plant the cover crop? So if we look at the script till and no-till, basically we just mowed off the cover crop and the crop, and then we plant the cover crop. In the bare ground, they had to go one pass with a roller tiller, two passes with a polymulcher, and then they planted the cover crop. So four steps, four times different machinery had to go into that field. And then with the black plaster, of course, the black plaster had to remove, then they had to go two pass with the roller tiller, two pass with the polymulcher, and then they planted the cover crop. So six steps. Now this may change depending on the, the equipment that the, the farm has. For this particular research station, with the equipment they had, this is how many times they had to go into that field to prepare it just to plant the cover crop. So again, this is cost savings, when you reduce the number of times you have to go in that field. So basically what we would say is that the characteristics of the cover crop residue is key for managing weeds in no-till and strip-till situation. Basically the more biomass you have, the higher CDN ratio you have, the probably the better weed suppression you're gonna get. 
Also, we think we would have got better weed suppression in that strip till and no-till plot if we use a, something like a crimper roller and undercutter. So I like the flare mower because what the flare mower does, it cuts it, those little cover crops in pieces and it spreads them out real nice and evenly all over the surface, but they are in smaller pieces. So it means they're gonna break down much faster. So if you have something like a roller crimper where you roll that entire thing down, the whole mat, it's gonna take a little bit longer for it to break down. You should have a lengthier period of weed control. And of course we need to look at additional cropping system um, as this technique would differ according to the cropping system, its competitiveness, as well as cover crop species. Some cover crop species are gonna work with others. So anyway, with respect to future research, one of the things we wanted to do was improve that strip till situation. We think there is some benefits to that strip till, but the, again, the problem we had was a lot of weeds kept building up within that till strip. So we think one of the things that may have been missing is chemical. So integrated, again, integrated weed management, you, lot, you have a lot of tools and chemical is one of them. And the idea is, is that, and I should step back and say, in some instance we created this problem with the strip till, because this is what I found out was going on. At the end of the season what I found was that they were actually strip tilling it twice. They were first strip till it, maybe two days before planting that eggplant or sweet corn. They throw down the fertilizer, and then they go in and strip till again to till in that fertilizer, and then they planted the eggplant. So remember the first rule of thumb I said you don't do? You don't feed the weeds. Basically, that's what we were doing. We were feeding the weeds. We, we till it, we disturb the soil. So when you disturb the soil, basically we stir it up a weed seed bed and we're gonna force germination. Not only that, then we threw down fertilizer. So even some of those that weren't dormant, we had those to come up. So we were feeding the weeds before we actually planted the crop. So the idea was we don't do that in the future. If you wanna do that situation, you strip till, you plant your crop, and then you ban the fertilizer so that the crop is more likely to uptake it before the weeds get to it. But we thought we could take advantage of that weed flush. So the idea is we go in and we strip till maybe three weeks before planting the cover crop. I'm sorry, three weeks before planting the crop. So what's going to happen? We're going to get a nice weed flush. And then what we can go in and do is once we get that nice weed flush, then we go in and do a bandit herbicide spray. Now, organic herbicides are expensive. It's just not economically feasible to, to broadcast organic herbicides in the entire field. But if we can limit it to this 10-inch strip, we can probably reduce the amount of spray that we need by 80% and maybe make it affordable. So the idea is once you spray, then you go in and you plant your crop. So if you plant that crop with limited soil disturbances, you may not get that second weed flush if you're lucky. But let's say we're gonna get that second weed flush. The idea is before you can get that second weed flush, that canopy is closed, so you're not gonna get those weeds to, to, to flush up. And then the second thing is use a living mulch. Because what happened to that residue? Eventually that residue breaks down, and when that residue breaks down, what happened? You have weeds to pop up. It may be late in the season, but eventually that residue is gonna break down. But if you use a living mulch, it's gonna be there the entire growing season. So you should not get any weeds to pop up that entire time. So that's why we want to sort of go through a living mulch. And there's other benefits to living mulches too. So that's why even though the no-till worked the best, we thought the living mulch had the greatest potential. So then I brought in Alan. So Gui was a soil scientist and Alan was a quarter entomologist. So the trick here was, how was I going to convince and a proud aquatic entomologist to do a weed project? And I didn't, and I said, you know what, I can't think of a way to do it, so I'm just going to go tell him. I said, you know, would you like to work with weeds? And he said, yes, I'd love to work with weeds. And I thought, that was way too easy, <laughs> way too easy. And then I found out why. He was thinking about a different weed. <laughs> So by the time he realized what I was talking about, it was too late. But he did start to enjoy learning about weeds. So again, this was another one of those multidisciplinary studies, but we're gonna focus mostly on the weed aspect. And it was pretty much the same agenda to look at weed density and biomass, time spent hand weeding and yield. So here we set up four treatments. 
One, we stick with the conventional till. Again, we went with the no-till. And then we looked at two different strip and till methods. One was the strip till where we used a roller crimper. And then the one was the strip tilling with the living mulch. So the first three treatments, we started out with a crimson clover and rye cover crop mix. And we used this seed rate, this eight and six to seven pounds per acre. The reason why we chose that rate is because this is acceptable by the Maryland cover crop program. So in other words, you can plant at this rate and you can still get the cost share money. And then here we went with the red clover. So we wanted to look at working with that living mulch. So basically this is what the treatment looked like. With respect to the no-till, basically again, that was the crimson clover and rye. We basically flail mow that cover crop and then we planted the peppers directly into that residue. Um, with the conventional till, basically they rototilled it a couple of times. So in the end, there was very little evidence of any cover crop residue on the surface. And then the strip till roll of crimp, basically what they did was they rolled that rye and crimson clover, and then they went in with the strip tiller to make the rows. Now the one thing you see, you see that little green area in there? That's because the crimson clover reseeded itself. So it's not a living mulch, the crimson clover reseeded itself, and that's why you see some green in between the, um, the pepper plant. And then in the strip till living mulch, basically what we did was we went in with the strip tiller, the strip till those rows where we're going to plant the pepper plants, and then we went in and we, we mowed the, um, um, the red clover. And basically we mowed it to try to eliminate competition. So then we looked at time. I'm just going to show data from time spent hand weeding as well as marketable yield. And this study was just completed last summer, so some of that data is still being analyzed. But we're going to start off with the mean time spent hand weeding. A lot of time was spent hand weeding, more than it should have been. But look what look at that strip till living mulch. The inter-row area, which is the area between the pepper rows, the inter-row areas, which is the amount of weeds within the row, we can see that by using the living mulch, we were able to reduce the amount of time that would dedicate to hand weeding. Now, one of the problems is what I found is I was trying to find out why did the no-till do so terrible? It shouldn't have done that terrible. And I asked Alan, and basically what he told me was that the reason why they did very well in conventional till is because they used hand hoeing, and they were able to do it really fast. He said in the no-till situation, they didn't use hoes. They were trying to, they were just pulling up the weeds. But he said it was very difficult to tell them you don't have to pull up every single weed. So he said even these really small weeds, that would just, they would try to pull them up. He said it added on to the time. Uh, but the other problem was, that was a perennial weed problem, nut sash. And they said pull up the nut sash took a tremendous amount of time. And in the strip till living mulch system, there wasn't a lot of nut sash. It sort of helped with that perennial weed problem. And then we look at yield. Now, yield was pretty much an embarrassment. Conventional till had the highest yield by far. But then look here, look at the no till and a strip till roller crimp. Now this didn't have anything to do with the cool soil temperature. Basically what happened was, in the no-till and strip till roller crimp, we had a lot of diseased pepper plants. And no one, has, no one knows what caused it. And we've sent it to the diagnostic lab and no one can determine what is causing these pepper plants to die. So we have no idea. But that's why we had that, that yield drop. Now in the strip till living mulch, we had a yield drop for a different reason, and I can show you what happened here. So here, this shows the different harvest periods. The yellow lines represents the yield of the pepper yield in the strip till living mulch, and the white in the conventional till. So basically what you can see is, it, it wasn't until around, once we reached after five weeks after planting, we can see that the yield was similar in those two. So for some reason, in that strip till living mulch, we sort of had a yield drag. And we think it may have to do with cooler soil. Because although we mowed that red clover, it sort of still sort of flopped over a little bit. And I think it made that soil a little bit cool, so the pepper were a little bit slow to grow. But then once we reached around fifth week, the fifth week, we saw things take off. And we suspected, what we suspected, that if we could have continued to harvest that pepper, we would have saw the, 
the yields start to get higher in the strip till 11 March system because during that last harvest we saw the yield really starting to pick up and a lot of fruits were on the plant. So in summary, what we found was there's a higher proportion of perennial weeds in the no-till and strip-till roller crimp plots. So basically what happened was is that one of the things I said you lose when you go from no-till, people don't like no-till because they can create a perennial weed problem. But the idea here is in the strip-till living mulch system, the reason why we didn't have that perennial weed problem is because we had that living mulch in between the peppers, right? So that means that weed couldn't develop. And we did till where the pepper plants were, were planted. So, that's what, so we took those perennial weeds out there before planting the peppers. Um, and we also found, again, the strip till roller crimp and no-till had a more unhealthy pepper plants. We still don't know what that disease is. And the strip till living mulch had the cleanest fruits, especially after rain events. So we noticed that there was less time once we picked the fruit, there was less time having to clean the fruit in the strip till um, living mulch. And that's probably less splashing of dirts on the, on the pepper fruit. We found the yield was greatest in conventional till. And then again, we think the early competition in the strip till living mulch added to that yield drag that we saw in that treatment. So we think that there's a couple of things we can do to eliminate that problem. One is widen that strip till. So there's more soil to heat up there and there's less overlap of that red clover. Um, other thing is using a rotary mower may be used to reduce early season competition. In other words, we use a rotary mower, but maybe we have to make it even shorter, make that, that living mulch or that red clover even shorter so that it does com compete well. But I think widening that strip is probably the best. Again, because that strip till that we make is only 10 inch wide. So I think we maybe need to widen out to something like 16 inches. And then I think there's less likely that that um, um, red clover is going to compete. So then I go to the question again. This was the question at the beginning. Can living mulch be deployed to conservation tillage systems to support the fight against weeds? And I think, yes, they can. They're very tricky. We have to, we have to figure out that competition thing. But I think we can. And, but what I wouldn't say is I would never tell anyone to, yeah, go out and plant your vegetable into a living mulch and you're going to have good weed control because we can only tell that value once we test it. And with that, just acknowledge some of the funding agencies. And uh, if you have any questions, I can try to address those. So, Rui, really, have you done anything with um, summer covers? As, as an example, between peas and you're going to come back in the fall with uh, cabbage after you harvest peas, putting in a cover to see having any impact? We've only used summer cover crops when we're going to rest the field because the weed field had a really bad weed. So sometimes what they tell you if you have a, they say if you have a, a field that has a terrible weed infestion, you grow a forage crop on it for a long time. But what we said, well, let's try to work with a cover crop that we can grow the entire season. So we did a mixture of something like, we did a mixture of sun hemp and buckwheat. And we use it like a perennial system because once you plant that sun hemp, it goes the entire season. The buckwheat, of course, it, it dies, mm -hmm. but then it reseeds itself. But it serves as a very good nursery crop for the sun hemp. So sun hemp is a little bit slower, but, the, but the, we plant the buckwheat because it's real fast, but the sun hemp doesn't mind, so it comes up. And then as the buckwheat senesces, there's no chance for the weeds to come up because now the sun hemp is up there. So we have used summer cover crops mainly for resting, <laughs> sort of using it as a fox forage crop. But not between two? A dying mulch. We used a dying mulch, but never a, a, a summer cover crop. Um, at least not in Maryland, I haven't. Just curious. Mm. But it's, it would be like using it as a companion plant. The same idea. <laughs> so what you're saying is it's legitimate. Sun hemp, um, like before, say fall planted green or green beans for fall harvest, like uh, early August planted. Can you get enough? Oh yeah. Mass out of the sun hemp. Yeah, definitely. In May or is it just too early? Um, uh, no, that's not too early. Okay. Actually, I should go back to your question. Actually, we, I'm sorry, we did, we did. I forgot about sun hemp. We planted sun hemp as a summer cover crop with summer squash. And we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, 
We know that sun hemp <laughs> works very good in um, building up free living nematodes, and these are the beneficial nematodes that are, are involved in nutrient cycling. So we were looking at nematode population, but we also looked at how intercropping it, it impact cucumber beetle population. So we did use it as a summer cover crop in that instance. What we found most interesting about the sun hemp in that case is sun hemp is known to increase the beneficial organism below the soil, but it only does it for a short period of time and then it disappears. So we had a nematologist who we were collaborating in Hawaii and she said, why don't you do a combination of sun hemp and an organic fertilizer, which we used um, uh, chicken manure. So we did a comparison between sun hemp and chicken manure, just sun hemp alone, and then sun hemp and a synthetic fertilizer. And what we found was that the mixture of the sun hemp and the chicken manure enhanced, we had those beneficial free living nematodes the entire cycle of that zucchini crop. And, and of course it's good because sun hemp um, it's a little path to, um, if you till it under, to some other plant parasitic nematodes. Between the strip till and the bare ground, do you know what the temperature differential was there? Between at the, planting? Um, possibly the soil scientists took, that, took those measurements, but I don't have them. <coughs> yeah, because she was monitoring the soil temperature throughout because I think in one of those studies she was, she was looking at the greenhouse gas emission, so she said it's important to monitor soil temperature for that also. And I should mention with respect to greenhouse gas, what we found was you get the greatest amount of emission from the bl plots with black plastic, followed by conventional till, followed by the strip till, and the least amount of greenhouse gas emission was from the no-till plots. Mm-hmm.